Um, we are continuing our series, actually the end of the series, that Pastor Vinny had started. And how many remember what the first five sermons and presentations he did? It was a book about the book of Galatians. Galatians, very good. Good students, he'll be proud of that. So, as we see in Galatians, Paul's letter to the Galatians, and he addressed a couple of different things. Um, one of the things that... Well, first of all, you do the first guys of this is his travels, and I'm always fascinated by maps. And putting this together, you should look at this. I mean, there's no cars. He had a boat maybe to get through through this, and even then, that was kind of um, that wasn't like a luxury. For the most part, he's going all over southern Asia and part of Europe and all that. These are long travels, and he hit a lot of churches. So I'm always amazed at Paul's missionary said that wasn't just. He had to walk, and his cohorts had to walk for the most part. I'm sure maybe they were on horses for some of it. But this is a long travel for him spreading the word. And just on foot, look at the area he covered and the churches that he influenced. So just as a personal fan of maps, I appreciate the journey from Judea all the way over to everybody coming back. That's, that's quite a journey. Um, Paul's main point is that he was addressing Galatians because it seems that the Galatians had started to have issues with the law, making the law a substitute for Christ. And in some cases, making their own man-made laws or taking things and putting it above the pure gospel. So, Galatians 6.6, 6, which states, those who are taught the word must share in all good things with their teacher. This is the theme that we will come back to. Now, sometimes, and teachers do this, so I thought I'd put up a chalkboard to kind of recap. And this is what's going to take the three hours because I'm going to redo <laughs> Vinny's. This is a tough room. No clock. <laughs> um, the first sermon, there is, one just, there is just one gospel. All others are fake and accursed. We can remember that. The second one was there is no excuse for racism, not even from an apostle. And we remember Pastor Vinny's, um, the example he mentioned was the police officer going into an IRS office and um, basically being at, drawn to the guy drew at gunpoint, um, even though he was a police officer and having every right to be there, and showing what can happen when you have unexamined fears. Uh, I just have another story to this to kind of see the reverse. And... Um, this was relayed to me by a pastor. He was pastoring a church in middle of California. For those of you who are familiar with California, there's southern and northern, and then you have kind of the middle area. And that middle area is surrounded by a lot of small towns, a lot of medium-sized towns. It's mostly farms. And um, that area also happens to be where a certain Viking, like right after World War II, kind of like roamed around and in some ways terrorized that area, but they were known to frequent that area. Um, so he had a small church in that area, and he remembers one Sabbath, come walking through those front doors, there was a couple, and they had the colors and everything. They were purely one of the most notorious biker gangs, and they walked in. Now, this is where we can apply racism or whatever ism, because when you see like today, if someone came through our door today, our, I mean, say, okay, what's going on? This person is clearly an outlaw. Why are they at our church? But something interesting happened. There was a little lady at the front who was the greeter at the front door. And she embraced them like they were long lost children. She says, so glad you're here. Is there anything you can do? Here's our bulletin. We'll usher you to your seat. She said the other members treated them the same. Hey, we're happy you're here. You're visiting us for somewhere. They treated them like any other visitor. Now, the guy wasn't having any of it. He was like, you know, he was like, yeah, gruff. They already said two words. The, his girlfriend with him got it, was like receptive. And it's a long story, so I'll cut it short. At the end of the sermon, the, pre the preacher was up, and they greet up, and he's going up, and he barely said. So he says, hey, happy you're with us. You know, what brought us to um, our church this day? My girlfriend woke up and she said, we got to go to church. And I said, well, well and I said, what, what are you talking about? I said, no, we have to go to church right now. And look at, it's Saturday. There's no church that's open. Of course, we know that 
what churches are open on Saturday? <laughs> if you're not Jewish, <laughs> there are others, but mainly us. So they got to this, and he said to the church. So long story short, and, there's, and if you, you can catch me a potluck, I can tell you some other stories that go along with his journey. Because of the acceptance, and they didn't choose to look at him as this person is this is and that is and the other, but they embraced him as one. He eventually, it took a lot of steps, he eventually became a deacon and an elder in that church and his girlfriend. Because that's the reverse. Instead of racism or whatever ism we color, our, we color and see people, you overcome that and view everyone as a child of God. Amen. And you feel it. So that's the, that's the positive side if you look at it the way God sees us. Um, then there's a salvation of worth ethic, the heritage that's just really, um, as Paul said, literally a new kind of witchcraft. Um, and then there's no longer slave or free, but we are all heirs to the promise. And one of the examples that we have, and all I like to use is we're heirs to the promise. Um, it's okay to be proud of who you are and where you're from. It's okay to be proud of being a Kenyan, to being an American, to being a man, to being a woman. It's okay to be proud of, yeah, I went to this school or that school. Um, Brother Saul, who we still pray for. If you ever had the chance to be, well, when you talk to Brother Saul, he is a very proud Jamaican. Very proud. He has a right to be. However, if you talk to him, he will tell you, yes, brothers, I am a Jamaican, but I am first and foremost a son of the living God. That is his identity. He has no problem, and we should have no problem identifying with, yes, I'm from Chicago. Yes, I'm from whatever, or my family is this, or I graduated from here. That's an accomplishment or it's something you inherited. Be proud of that. But your identity is in the living God. And that's where we are no slave or free. We are all heirs to the promise. So that's the message of that. Be, it's okay to be proud where you're from, but know that first and foremost, we serve, we are a child of the king. And lastly, to avoid works of the flesh by keeping in step with the fruit of the Spirit. Now, Paul summarized Galatians in three key points. And these points are going to be given, um, if you read your Bible holy dutifully, and if you go through and you go through Galatians 6, you say, hey, wait a minute, those points are taken out of order. Yes, they were, um, but they are all important. I just jumbled it up for um, the points I wanted to emphasize. Now, we're going to talk, the first key point is, do not hoard your blessings, but, with, uh, but share them with those who brought you the gospel. Paul's point is, now that you know, now that you have been instructed, go out and share that with others, and then come back and share that with the one who brought you the word, because you will both be blessed. Galatians 6.10, when we can do good to every, when we do when we can do good to everyone, let us do it. Let us try even harder to do good to the family of believers. Meaning that do good to everyone, but especially your family members, your solid rock members, your neighbors, those of our believers, make sure we take extra care to take care of them. Now, while doing that, I'm thinking of a teacher-mentor relationship. And some of you may recognize a couple of these like different teacher-mentor relationships. Um, the one on the left, that the up on the right. Some of you, if you're dated like me, that came from the TV show Kung Fu. And that's basically his mentor. And, that, and then the other is a pilot instructing a student. And wouldn't you be excited if you were a pilot and you did your first solo flight? Who's the first person you're going to tell, hey, I had a successful solo flight? Your teacher. But when you got it, because how much, how proud is your teacher going to be that, great, you didn't crash. <laughs> I'm validated. You didn't crash. We're, we're, you're good. And if you want to learn more, and then they can tell others, hey, my teacher was great. I'll take you for a flight. And go, oh, no, I'm like, no, 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 trust me. I can take you for a flight. And you can share that with your teacher. The same way with, with this. If you have something, share it with your teacher. That's what Paul was saying. And then you're both will be blessed. Um, 
the, the, the Kung Fu um, story uh, that I have as far as like, well, it's not necessarily a blessing, but it's, it's, it's what happens when you share with others. Um, there's a story um, about a, let's say, Kung Fu Master X, and Warrior A was talking to Warrior B. And Warrior A was saying, have you heard of Kung Fu Master X? He's from Shaolin Temple, whatever. And Warrior B says, no, I haven't met him, but I fought one of his students and he defeated me. And Warrior A said, then his Kung Fu is good because he's able to teach it to others where they can master it as well. I think you're beating people, but what you're saying, the, the point of the story is, once, you inst- once you've been shared and given the gift of the gospel by whoever brought it to you, it all comes from the Holy Spirit, then Paul says, go and share that, what you have shared with others, with your, the person who brought it with you, so that you can share in the blessing, and then you can bring even more people to that tent. Again, as you said, when you pass your driver's test, one of the first people I wanted to talk to was the person who got me through uh, driver's school and say, hey, you know what? I passed. They could not have been more happier. Um, when you graduate and you see that line and you see the teacher that really helped you, you give them a big hug and say, you know what? If it wasn't for you, I wouldn't have made it through this class. You don't know how much that helps that teacher because that inspires that teacher to go on and teach the next crop of knuckleheads. <laughs> Hopefully get them ready. The next um, point we want to do is if you, if, uh, if you made the cut or not, it doesn't matter. Um, and the verse that Paul emphasized, and if you read it, you don't know how much Paul emphasizes, but he literally says, see what big words, how big I'm writing my letters. That's essentially, if you text, and you text in all caps, what does that say? When you get a receive, receive in all caps, what do you do? What's the first thing? I heard somebody, yeah, you're shouting at me. Why are you shouting at me? Paul is literally shouting at them in this point. Um, For neither circumcision nor uncircumcision is anything, but a new creation is everything. Galatians 6.15. And the issue, what he was addressing was circumcision, but there was a bigger point he was trying to make. The bigger point he was trying to make is, let's just say license. How many recognize these? How many have one of these? Not the kids yet, but they will. Um, License. We see there are all types of license. Licenses are needed. Do we need a license? Well, if we're going to drive, we need a license. Do you need a license to practice accounting? Mm, You can, but it helps. Do you need a license to be a doctor? Yeah, even though some people try to go. So licenses are good. There's nothing bad in having a license. In fact, it's kind of an accomplishment. So having a license is not bad, but do you need a license to accept the gospel? Okay, but sometimes we may confuse having a license with something really important like it's life altering. It can be because it can help you drive, but Paul is saying you're missing the point. So let us read this verse where verse 12, and I'll have you read it. Um, I will read the yellow and you as the audience will read the blue. So I will read the yellow and I'll stop and you'll say the word. So some people are trying to force you to be circumcised so that the Jews will accept them. They are afraid they will be attacked if they follow only the cross of Christ. Those who are circumcised do not obey the law themselves, but they want you to be so they can brag about what they forced you to do. Okay, so now I'm going to have you read the yellow, and I will read the blue. Okay, start. Some people... Licensed. 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 You see Paul's point. Nothing wrong with having a driver's license. 
Nothing wrong with being circumcised. Paul was himself. He says, if you're a Jew and you came over as a Christ believing as a Jew, that's fine. But don't force the Galatians to do that. And just because and, you're, and Paul says you're not following the law themselves. Don't force somebody to get a driver's license if they don't need it. It's important if they want to drive, yes. And it's interesting that Paul says they do not obey the law. Is it the law to have a driver's license to drive? Yes. Is it part of Moses' law to be circumcised? Yes. But Paul was saying, but that's not the gospel. That's for the Jews. But you're missing the point. Whether you're circumcised, whether you're not circumcised, whether you have a, whether you have a license, whether you have a college degree or not, that is not the gospel. That is not what you need to be saved. It's important to accomplish certain things, but don't lose the point. Now I'm going to go controversial. I'll put in another one. You guys are going to look at me. And I know Dan and everybody's going to look at me when I put, replace this word. All right, let's do this again. You guys read the yellow, and I will replace another word with the blue. Some people are trying to force you to be a vegetarian. So the Jews will accept it. They are afraid they will be attacked if they follow only the cross of Christ. Those who are vegetarian do not obey the law themselves. But they want you to be a vegetarian so they can brag about what they force you to do. Amen. We as Adventists, even as Christians, even helpful, thoroughly believe in the vegetarian diet. However, does it replace the gospel? Do you need to be a vegetarian? Paul was saying he has nothing wrong with that. But when you replace that and you make that more important than the gospel itself, what Christ is teaching, then you're in out of step. Amen. And they had gotten to the point where circumcision, they were forcing other Christians to be vegetarians. All right, it's going to get back to the conference, but I don't work for the conference. <laughs> Nothing wrong. We have a health message that espouses that. We practice juicing. All of that is great. We're not saying, and don't twist my words, I'm not saying it's not great to be a vegetarian, it's not great to have, all all that's good. But don't lose sight. Don't make that the priority over what God is teaching you. To be saved. To live a healthy life, yes. To have the convenience of being able to get from A to B, it's nice to have a driver's license. But if you don't have one, okay, you can get through you'll probably have a better time of it, but if you don't need it, because God wants you to focus on his relationship with you. Amen, Peter. Amen. The third key point um, I want to make is bear each other's burdens through Christ. Um, by helping um, each other through your troubles, you will truly obey the law of Christ. If anyone thinks he or she is important when there really is not, he himself is fooling himself. One of the things that we, that Paul wanted to emphasize is not only share your blessings with the one who taught you, but also, please, do not hold the burdens that you're having inside of you. Do not hold it in you because God has an outlet. First and foremost, He wants you to come to Him and bear your soul because God knows all. But second, if you can find others, you know, others that you can trust or other that God leads you to. Bear each other's burdens through Christ. Clint Hill story. The Clint Hill story is the third point of, of my little talk this, after, this, uh, this morning. Um, Clint Hill was a Secret Service agent. Uh, he got started in the 50s. He was a Secret Service agent for... Eisenhower was the first president he served under, and it went through Nixon, maybe at the little bit of Ford, but that, that, that by that time he had, he had retired. And just a little bit of story about Clint Hill. He um, was drafted and served in the Korean War, and while he was in the Army in the Korean War, he was selected. These groups, do, you do not volunteer for these special groups, you select it. And he was selected for special ops, special forces to be in because they saw talent in him. So he served that in the Korean War. And when he got out, um, a buddy of his, because he didn't know exactly what he was going to do, he figured he was going to go into commercial work, and a a friend of his, a colleague, says, hey, why don't you apply to the Secret Service? 
And he goes, really? I said, Secret Service? He says, yeah, you got the skills for it. I know, how good, I know how, what a good operator you were in the Korean War. I think you'll be perfect for us. So he got in, you know, through a recommendation. Again, Secret Service, again, only selects the best of the best. And he thrived. And the first president he served under was um, uh, Eisenhower. And he said he got along with Eisenhower great. Eisenhower was really um, good to him. And he had a great time. And he said at that time, the Secret Service, still under the Treasury Department, was small, um, small group. And at that time, it was all male. But that, during the time in the you know, 50s and 60s, that wasn't unusual. But there was a close brotherhood uh, because they were literally putting their lives on the line for everybody. So um, when Kennedy was elected, uh, he was excited because he got along with um, John Kennedy and he was assigned the presidential detail. However, he was assigned Jackie, not John Kennedy. And he said that was kind of, that kind of hurt his pride a little bit because you want to get the top dog. You want, as a Secret Service agent, if you get on presidential detail, you want the president because that's where the prestige is. It's the first lady, it's great, but, uh, but what he realized is by being the First Lady's main uh, Secret Service agent, that uh, John Kennedy made sure he had a very close relationship with Clint because he always said he wanted, obviously, his wife and his young family to be protected. So through that, he got a very close relationship with John and Jackie. So it was the best of both worlds. Uh, so as you can see in this picture, this is November 22nd, 1963. Um, as you can see, he is standing on the, the, the cars. You can see the motorcade. And by the way, um, a little bit of background history. Um, as his motorcade is coming through, this was the political camp. This was a political stop. Um, John Kennedy, that was a very close election in 1960 uh, between Nixon and Kennedy. And part of the reason was they, he barely carried the South. So they wanted to make sure that they carried the South. And they targeted, at that time, the two biggest states, Florida and Texas. The first part was Florida and it was success. They had big crowds, big reception, it was great. They flew into Dallas and they said the airport was packed, the hotel was packed. They said they hadn't seen crowds that big in the South ever, particularly for a Irish Catholic Democrat, you know, from the North. They said it was great. So he said the political people were ecstatic. And as a parade, this is a small sample, but I've seen other pictures of them going down Main Street through Dallas. It was light, it was packed, wall to wall. Well, as they're making that, tall, that, that turn around Daly Plaza, they had to slow down um, to, to make it onto an off-ramp to the location they were going. He is standing on that side, on the passenger, on the driver's side, because Jackie is on the driver's side passenger seat, and he's assigned to protect Jackie. Uh, President Kennedy is on the passenger side back seat. So you can see that's, that's the, one of the main reasons why he's standing on that side. So as the motorcade was going, he remembers hearing, at that time he didn't necessarily know it was a shot, it was just a loud noise. And as that loud noise hit, he was like looking to where it came from, and then his eyes, what, peered over here, and he saw John going like this. And so that's when he, ex that's when he went into action. You can see these pictures. He immediately jumped, and he heard two more shots, and he actually he said he could actually kind of feel the other one going by, go past him, and he was hopping onto the car, um, and as you can see, he said he tried to wedge himself in between um, the, where the shoot, shooters were coming from, and both John and Jackie. And he says by that time, as you can see the color picture, as he's climbing up, um, the headshot already happened. John had already been hit, President Kennedy, in the head, and he slumped over into Jackie's lap. This picture over here, which he's, I said in an interview, everybody assumes that Jackie is coming to help him up. It's kind of a gruesome detail. She wasn't necessarily doing that. She was picking up parts of her husband's brain. And she was trying to pull it back in and kind of a way to, oh, maybe we can save it. You're in shock. And he had to climb up himself and wedge himself in. So you can imagine, and this is pretty well documented, that he felt beyond horrible as they rushed off to Parkland. He said he felt he failed. Your Secret Service agent, your main job is to protect the president and the president's family. And he failed in do that, and he went into a very deep depression. Uh, it ate him up. Now, he continued to, to serve. Um, he, actually, when, he actually continued to be uh, Jackie Kennedy's bodyguard 
um, after she left, even though she was still serving the Secret Service, they signed a, a detail. And he continued on. He stayed on through um, Johnson. He stayed on through Nixon. And at the tail end of the Nixon administration, he, they moved him to a desk job and he retired. But what he said was that he was a mess. He never talked about what happened to anyone. He just kept it all inside. And he ended up self-medicating, and he's self-medicating as he was ended up drinking himself, literally drinking himself to death. Um, he never opened up about it. He never went, talked to anybody about it. Even though he was one of the most decorated Secret Service agents, he carried that guilt. He carried that responsibility that it was because of my inactions, the course of history changed. And he carried that guilt. And I share the story is, we as failed humans, we as sinful humans, how much guilt are we carrying about things we didn't do, things we did do, things that, boy, I wish I could take it back. Oh, there's somebody that passed away and I wish I had made up or I wish I had some, I wish things had changed. We all carry that guilt. He carried it to the nth degree. And you can tell that the pictures, that was him young, that at that time that was taken at Dallas before they got in the motorcade. Who knew? that the events would change, that would literally change the world. And you can see him now, and they said it ate him up. But what happened was he started to, in 1990 he went back. There was an author that wanted to do a book, and at that time he didn't, but the doctor says, you got to stop drinking. So he went back to Daily Paz in 1990. That was the first time he'd been back since the assassination. And he went by himself, and he looked out, and he went to the uh, Texas School Book Depository, just to look and see for himself, and he finally came, there's nothing I could have done. I did everything I could, it's not my fault. But that started the process, writing the book and opening up. He finally says, when I started to talk about it, when I started to share this with others, that's when I was able to release this burden. That's when I was able to basically be able to come to grips and find forgiveness in myself. By helping each other with your troubles, you will truly obey the law of Christ. In Galatians 6, 2. We have groups, you have people, hopefully that you can turn to if you're going through something that's horrific or you can't let something go. But you are literally obeying the law of Christ if you can find someone. Lead, let the Holy Spirit lead you to someone. There's excellent groups. I personally advocate um, Celebrate Recovery. Celebrate Recovery does this in the most Christian, the most supportive, the most prayerful way where you can bear your burdens in a safe place. And it is such a relief. And I encourage all of you even haven't attended one, go, you'll find it worthwhile. But that's just one. There are a lot of self-help groups. And you go to prayer meeting. You can pick, up, pick somebody else, pastor, elder, a friend. You're carrying burdens. And Paul says you do not have to. Bear your burdens with others because you are literally obeying the law of Christ. Go find a minister and don't carry all of this. Paul is saying, share your blessings with your mentor. Share your blessings with the one who brought you the word. But also, bear your burdens with one another that God may be glorified in you. Marvin, you go ahead and start. Walking around these walls, I took by now day fall. But you have never failed me yet. Waiting for change to come, knowing the battles won. For you have never failed me yet. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never failed me. Yet. I know that night won't last.
past. My heart will sing your praise again. Jesus, you're still enough. Keep me within your love. My heart will sing your praise again. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never fail me yet. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never fail me yet. want to just recap the, the, the recapping the three things that Paul wanted to mention that wanted to, his Galatians to know that if you've been taught now you must go and teach the word to others that God is not mocked by the actions of Christians bearing the burdens with others taught people are not deceived if they receive the pure gospel Meaning God says, if you get the pure truth, you're not going to be deceived by anyone. And you're not going to be mocking, you're not going to be mocking God, preaching circumcision over the law of God and the grace of God. And to live with Jesus Christ, your King, in your heart by taking the opportunity to show God's love and grace to others. That is Paul's wish, and that is my wish for all of you. Thank you for spending a few moments with us here. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never fail. Your promise still stands. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Your faithfulness, I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never fail me. Your promise, come on. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Your faithfulness, I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence, you never failed me yet.